Now there's a brand new web page, especially for this podcast. The Politocrat Daily Podcast can now be found on thepolitocrat.com. A brand new page that centralizes all of the places that you can listen to this podcast. The major platforms and many others at thepolitocrat.com. Lots of content that you can see there right now and every single day. So subscribe now to the Politocrat Daily Podcast and make sure you visit thepolitocrat.com. Thank you. Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Thursday, January the 14th, 2021. On this episode of The Politocrat. On this vote, the ayes are 232, the nays are 197. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Donald Trump impeached again. That was Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing the final vote in yesterday's impeachment vote on Donald J. Trump, who was found and charged, at least, with the incitement to insurrection in last week's terrorist attack at the U.S. Capitol building. More on the impeachment and reaction to it. My thoughts, plus some other things that we should be considering as we get ready for a second Senate trial in under a calendar year. All of that coming up next. Today, in a bipartisan way, the House demonstrated that no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. That Donald Trump is a clear and present danger to our country, and that once again, we honored our oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help us God. And now... I sadly, and with her heart broken over what this means to our country, of a president who would incite insurrection, will sign the engrossment of the article of impeachment. Welcome back. That was Speaker Nancy Pelosi yesterday before she engrossed or signed the article of impeachment for incitement of insurrection, on which the House just voted to charge Donald J. Trump with. Donald Trump has now been impeached twice. He is the first person to hold the highest office in the land to have been impeached twice while occupying that office. It's been twice now in literally less than 13 months. It has been twice now in literally less than 400 days that Donald J. Trump has been impeached. This time, the Senate must convict him. I'm going to get into the Senate in a little bit, but I do want to start with what happened yesterday. In this almost full year now of coronavirus, a pandemic that has really laid waste all over the world, devastated people, particularly here in the United States and elsewhere, 
there was one small consolation amidst a 2021 that has begun inauspiciously at best as we continue with the sharp rise in cases of coronavirus and, of course, people dying from the virus. The horror of last week, the terror attack in the United States, on the United States Capitol, by the vagabonds, thugs, military, and the ultra-violent seditionists and terrorists. And so one week later, just to put a cap on that, the same Capitol building that was attacked was the venue where the House of Representatives voted to impeach Donald J. Trump for incitement to insurrection. All you have to do, if you are anybody at all, is with the access to a computer, internet, is look at the speech that he gave. Just watch that speech or listen to that speech that Donald J. Trump gave on Wednesday, January the 6th, around noon Eastern time. All you have to do is watch or listen to that speech. There does not need to be some kind of testimony process. There does not have to be any kind of, oh, we just get some witnesses. This is on tape. It's on a video recording. It is very easy to see and it's very easy to see and interpret. There's nothing really, in fact, to interpret. It's all very clear and plain. Donald J. Trump certainly incited that crowd. You do not need to put two and two together to know that. It's very easy. The House of Representatives did the right thing on Wednesday. As did the 10 Republicans who joined the 222 Democrats. Hardly a surprise that the Democrats were going to all vote for this because it's very, very clear. Why wouldn't they? And quite frankly, more Republicans should have joined the 10 who did vote. But the line has been drawn. It shows you that there's still 197 Republican Congress people who believe that Donald J. Trump did not have anything to do with the violence that he absolutely incited. Now, is it because they really don't know? Or is it because they really do know, but want to kiss up to him and want to further engender all of this fear and hate for the purposes of gaining more power. What do you think? I'm inclined to say the latter. I'm also inclined to say that, yes, they know better than how they behave. All of the debate that took place yesterday, the ranting and raving and the histrionics and all of the drama plays by Jim Jordan and others made for a very embarrassing and pathetic grandstanding spectacle. There were some very effective Democratic speeches. Cori Bush in particular did herself proud. And she was promptly booed for saying that white supremacist um, president needs to be removed. And of course he needs to be removed. She made it very clear that black lives were the agenda and the mandate, and I really appreciate and applaud her for doing so. 
I think also a good speech was the one by Steny Hoyer um, to cap off the two-hour debate, two-hour-plus debate that they had. I can say that I am relieved that Donald Trump was impeached a second time. I absolutely am. Although it was never in doubt. After what happened last week in that terror attack, that terrorist attack by Trump thugs and violent seditionist insurrectionists, there was no question that a message had to be sent. And Speaker Pelosi, with the speech that you just heard a few minutes ago, certainly set and sent that message. Speaker Pelosi certainly was able to send a very strong message that nothing like this must ever happen again. As for the United States Senate, and I'll get to them, the Democratic Congress people who will be the impeachment team for the Democrats and this will be the second impeachment team of course in the last year plus that team the House impeachment team House impeachment managers team will be led by Jamie Raskin now you know that just a week or two ago he lost one of his children. It was a very, very sad loss. And he really hasn't properly mourned. I use the word properly in quotes, but he really hasn't had the time to mourn. He has been so concentrated on this impeachment effort. So after what happened last week, I mean, he was just starting to be in mourning. Um, I think he had lost his son very recently and um, he just started to be in mourning. And then, of course, this terrorist attack happened and he was into overdrive and then the rush to make sure that they held this guy accountable. I think that he thought, did Donald Trump, that because this was going to be just two weeks from the end of his term, there would be no way they could try to impeach him. Well, he miscalculated that, didn't he? He's not a particularly bright person, is he? Because when you've got Donald Trump on video screaming these words recorded by the cameras, picked up by the audio. Why is there a need to scramble to put anything together, really? The video speaks for itself, as do, well, as does Donald Trump. The House impeachment managers are led, will be led, by Jamie Raskin. And then he's the chief manager. Then the remainder of the House impeachment managers team for the House Democrats are Diana DeGette of Colorado, David Cicilline of Rhode Island. He was one of the people along with um, Representative Raskin who wrote the bill. Joaquin Castro, he is also one of the impeachment managers and you may remember him because he is the twin brother of Julian Castro out of Texas. Eric Swalwell out of California. In fact, he's not he's down the road from here. Well, not quite down the road, but he is, you know, he's in the he's in Northern California. Margaret Dean, Joe Nagoose. I think Joe Nagoose is uh, from Colorado. I forget which state uh, Margaret Dean is in. Representative Dean, Representative Nagoose and Representative Ted Liu who is also a California congressman, um, Southern California for him. He also was one of the uh, writers of the impeachment resolution. And finally, Sylvia, I believe her name is Sylvia, or Stacy, excuse me, Stacy Plaskett. Stacy Plaskett is a delegate from the Virgin Islands. She will be 
part of that house impeachment managers team. So completely different people from last time. Um, given the nature of the impeachable offense, that's why. And second of all, um, why not give different people the chance? I think what's interesting to me is as I look at this particular impeachment team, I did think to myself, well, why isn't Representative Al Green of Houston, Texas, not on that list? I mean, the person who was most ardent about impeachment from the very start back in, what, 2017? No doubt it was Representative Green. But for some reason, that was not the way that Speaker Pelosi went and she decided to go elsewhere. I also think of Congresswoman Maxine Waters. I think she should have been part of that team. What is it? Is it that Speaker Pelosi thinks that somehow the Republicans who are going to be hearing this evidence are going to not like Speaker, I mean, Representative Waters? I mean, what what's going on there? I'm sure she's more than capable of presenting a case. She does it so well on the House floor. Why wouldn't she be so great on the Senate floor? Of course she would be. So that is the House team, interestingly enough. The House impeachment managers. And as far as the Senate goes, the Senate is not apparently going to open until the 19th. There had been some reporting in several publications, including the New York Times, that suggested that the Senate trial of Donald Trump, the second impeachment trial, was going to happen as early as Friday and that there had been some kind of agreement reached between the incoming Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and the outgoing Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. But apparently, judging from the statement made by Mitch McConnell um, yesterday, well, that's not going to be the case. It looks very much as if now that you're going to have um, a very different scenario and you're going to see the Senate open not on Friday, but on Tuesday. And that the Senate trial is going to happen after Donald Trump leaves, which really gives me extra confidence that the United States Senate is going to vote to convict him. As I said in yesterday's episode, and may, or maybe the episode before that, just because they might convict him after he's gone doesn't mean it's a failure. It is absolutely not. And it doesn't mean it doesn't apply. It surely does. It does apply. And it applies on the record. So that's that's just a fact there. So Mitch McConnell is apparently going to get this trial underway on Tuesday or thereabouts sometime next week. And or certainly if it's not next, if it's not Tuesday specifically, it may be after Joe Biden is sworn in, which means it would in theory be either Thursday or Friday. They certainly wouldn't be um, starting the trial on Wednesday. That's the day he's sworn in. He being Joe Biden. So the chances of that happening are next to none. So you've got Thursday and you've got Friday. So in another week. And, and change. You could have. The beginning of the second Senate impeachment trial of Donald Trump. So we shall see what happens. There will be a lot of negotiating behind the scenes, I'm sure. And I think very confidently that you're going to end up getting something like 16 or 17. I think you need 17. I'm very confident you'll get those 17 uh, Supreme 
uh, the the Seth Supreme, get these sixteen or seventeen um, Republican senators. Excuse me. There's more to come on this edition of the Politocrat, and I'll be right back. I just want to play you this piece of audio from Sky News that I came across last night. And it just says everything you need to know about some of these people who still support this guy. This is a family of four. And the voice you're going to hear is that of a young man. He's probably in his 30s. Or, you know, mid-30s, early 30s, something like that. He's probably 30, 31. Something like that, if I had to guess. You see his girlfriend, partner, or wife standing there, you know, watching the interview. And you see his two kids. You see their two kids. A daughter and a son. And just listen to this few seconds of audio. Just listen to this. I am hoping that it doesn't get violent, but the way that they keep pushing things, it makes no sense as to why they're doing certain things. And it seems like they're doing it just to Americans. So you curse in front of your kids and you're cursing on air. So they have to bleep that out. And your kids who, if you look at those children that he has, they look like they're both maybe five years old one of them looks like they're maybe four four years of age the other one's maybe five or six years old seven max and you hear her at the end there the child the girl saying oh so you're cursing in front of your kids that is one supporter of the guy who just got impeached yesterday giving you his two cents It just really engenders a lot of things. And you ask yourself, or I ask myself, doesn't somebody like this know the meaning of responsibility? Why are you cursing in front of your children? And I'm sure that they are not alone. Maybe there's people listening to me who do that with their children. I just think that this is absolutely asinine. So you are cursing in front of your kids And you're doing it on top of that on television. No wonder this country is in such bad shape. You know how you can uh, do something about the Senate in terms of making sure that the Senate actually does its job uh, in the impeachment trial this time and actually votes to convict this clown who is going to be out of town for good in just six days time. Here's the secret of getting the Senate to do what you'd like them to do. And that is starting out by going to opensecrets.org. Now, opensecrets.org is a really good place to go to see who donates to whom. So, which politicians get money from where? Which corporation gives that money to which politician? I want you to do me a favor, and I'm going to link up to this website in the liner notes of this episode. And I would like you to go to opensecrets.org, which is run by the Center for Responsive Politics. I believe they are a nonpartisan group. And what I want you to do is look at the Senate. Type in a Republican senator's name. Lindsey Graham, Pat Toomey, Susan Collins, all that. You go down the line and you can find the senators very easily. You can either go online and do a search for the Republican senators in the 117th Congress, or you can very simply go to senate.gov. And you can easily find the Republican senators there. It's very, very easy to do. 
And I want you to start typing in the names of these senators and find out who it is that's donating money to them. And then what I want you to do is once you find out who their campaign contributors are, which corporations, I would like you then to get in touch with those corporations, either via phone, via Twitter, via email. And however you do this, make sure that you do it soon and pressure these companies because what's happening now is that these corporations have made it clear, Eli Lilly, Nike, all kinds, that they will not give a red cent to any of these Republican politicians who align themselves with Donald Trump in any way, shape or form. So if any of these Republicans today, for example, knowing that, continue to vote for Donald Trump by not impeaching him, well, they know that they're not going to get any more donations from these corporations. So if you want to be effective and you want to send a message, Make sure you do contact these corporations and talk about the people that they are donating money to and and tell them, look, this, this senator over here is not sure. We've got to nudge him to to vote to convict and make sure you tell them that, hey, company X, if you're still giving money to Ted Cruz, you've got to stop because he is still aligned with Donald Trump. So opensecrets.org is the place to go. It's incredible the amount of information you find. It's just staggering. Type in these senators' names, these Republicans, and you will really see just how um, that money's coming into them. So that will have an effect. It really will. Again, I'll link to the website in the liner notes of this episode. OpenSecrets.org That's one way. Because money talks. It certainly does. And when you've got Congress people dialing for dollars at least three days a week, money really talks. So if you want to see at least 17 Republican senators voting To convict Donald Trump, make sure you check out opensecrets.org and make sure you persuade, cajole, and make it very clear that there has to be a better way forward here. And you cannot continue to fund or finance people who are aligned with someone who tried to kill a lot of people last week with his words and the actions of his violent, cultish, terrorist followers. OpenSecrets.org For conversation information, and revelation. It's the Politocrat Daily Podcast with me, Omar Moore. Subscribe now and spread the word. Thank you for your support. Welcome back. Two things that I want to talk about here. One of them is about the Senate, I want to amplify something. Mitch McConnell, who is a very dastardly, very clever, and very powerful United States Senator, he is arguably the most powerful person in the country, especially right now, even as the outgoing majority leader of the Senate. And I'll tell you why I think that is the case. This is somebody who has single-handedly changed, or I would say defaced and destroyed the United States Senate, more so than Donald Trump has, and in addition to that, has managed to usher in 
hundreds of federal judges. He kept vacancies open during Obama's final four years, especially his final two years. Hundreds of vacancies. He slow walked everything. He wouldn't allow President Obama's picks to even get a hearing. One of his picks for some kind of office, I forget which it was, died waiting for a hearing. That is a true story. I don't know if it was for a judgeship or if it was for something else. It was some kind of ambassadorship and or something like that. And this particular pick actually died and never got that hearing. I mean, Mitch McConnell has done some unholy things. And he may be saying, well, you know, I, I support the Democrats impeaching, but we don't really know yet where he is. We'll see. I think he's going to go in and vote to convict, quite frankly. But we'll see. Money does influence things. I talked about OpenSecrets.org. And, you know, I'd say this, that maybe corporations are putting one over him. And maybe that's why his tune has been a little bit more chirpy toward the idea of conviction or at least impeachment. But there's no doubt that Mitch McConnell has... A lot of power still, a lot of power, at least for these next few days. You know, this is a guy who stood in front of a Confederate battle flag years ago. And now we're looking for the white terrorist who was in that picture that we've seen all over the place with a big Confederate battle flag. Hopefully they find that guy, that thug, that terrorist and and throw him in behind bars because that's where he belongs. Hopefully they get him. It's interesting with Mitch McConnell. This is a guy who is claiming, well, we can't open the Senate back up this week because there's just not much time left and Trump's leaving anyway. Well, first of all, I'll believe Trump's leaving when I see it on January the 20th, once Joe Biden is sworn in at 12.01 p.m. Eastern time. Second of all, I really do think that Mitch McConnell knows that he is full of crap. And number three... This is a guy, Mitch McConnell, who rammed through a U.S. Supreme Court pick in record time during an election season, something that has never been done before and is basically a sacrosanct thing to leave that period of time available for the election process to play itself out and not have some kind of political appointment during that time. And Mitch McConnell violated all of that. He certainly violated his own rule from just at that time, four years before, when in 2016, he was saying, well, the people's will must be done and we can't possibly seat Merrick Garland in February of 2016 or so, because there's still 11 months of President Obama's term. And my goodness me, there's going to be an election in what, Huh? maybe, uh, what you call it? Nine months from then and nine months from February of, you know, 2016. And we need to know who's going to win that election. So we're not going to seat any Supreme Court justice pick now, even though my Article 1 responsibilities under the United States Constitution mandate that I absolutely do. You know, that little thing called advice and consent. And I'm going to disregard it. That's what Mitch McConnell does. He disregards the Constitution. He swears an oath like he did a couple of weeks ago and then craps all over the very oath that he swore upon. Oh, and guess what? Do you know that Elaine Chao, his spouse, decided to quit her position in the Trump administration? Oh, yeah. She was one of the earliest to bolt that cabinet. And I don't mean bolt it like I'm going to secure my place here. I mean, bolt that cabinet as an I'm getting the heck out of this place. You remember that song from the animals? We ha- you know, we got to get out of this place. I mean, come on, that's exactly what she did. And by the way, her businesses are under scrutiny as well in her native China. 
And Mitch McConnell himself has businesses that are arguably doing some very shady things. Not even arguably. So you've got someone who is a shrewd, adept, extremely smart politician. Now that's just being honest. He is very shrewd and smart about how he operates politically. And he is ruthless too. That cannot be denied. I have no problem saying that about Mitch McConnell because it's true. He's smart. He is shrewd. He is calculating. He is extremely dangerous and he wields power ruthlessly. Now, this is something that I have criticized the Democratic Party about. I had criticized Speaker Pelosi about it. I will not be criticizing Speaker Pelosi, at least certainly not on this episode, after what we saw yesterday. There is still a matter of the stimulus bill. I know people who have got their checks. I don't know if you have got your check yet. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how that's going for you. But I can tell you that now that this impeachment is done in the House, there needs to be a focus on an agenda for us now. And we have to also get back to that. Because we cannot, cannot, and cannot fall asleep again like we did with Obama. We've got to be active. We've got to stay on our toes. Mitch McConnell certainly breaks the rules and is a lawbreaker. And I am glad that he is no longer going to be the majority leader after this coming Wednesday is up with. He'll pretty much be done. He'll still be in the Senate, but he won't be the majority leader, which is really good news. But this idea that Mitch McConnell is this voice of reason, and as I said yesterday in the episode, do not make him out to be a saint, even if he does vote to convict. Don't make him out to be this special person. Because he's doing this for expediency. Trump is going to be out the door. You know, he doesn't want to get on the wrong side of the corporations that fund that, uh, you know, fund him. So he's going to say and do those kinds of things in public view. So those corporations don't take their monies from his campaign coffers and that they continue to donate to him. Such is politics. We'll see where Mitch McConnell falls ultimately. But it is clear that he is open to looking at a possible yes vote. We will see. Because if he is, if he's even floating that, then it's over. Donald Trump will be removed, even if he is out of office. And there's actually apparently some precedent for doing that with others. Now, I don't know. You know, I... I uh, all I know is, is that I want him never to have any public service again. Donald Trump never did serve the public. He only served himself. So no public office for you, Donald. And certainly your family has to get off the stage as well. We cannot disaggregate his family from him. They all have to sit down and go home. It's just a really important thing that Mitch McConnell, now that his power is going to be diluted by the time we get to just after the middle of next week, starts to act with a little bit more humility. We'll see if that ever happens from him. But I am concerned about one thing. And I don't know if I conveyed it here or not, but I am concerned about one thing. And I'm going to tell you what that is right after this. Welcome back. One of the things that I am concerned about as we are now just six days away from the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris is security for them. You know, I've made my concerns known here, as you know, as to the safety and security of the inauguration event to be held on January 20th and whether or not it wouldn't be a better idea to just move the event somewhere else in an undisclosed area. 
And I had made it clear that it wouldn't be a case of the Biden inaugural committee being chickens or anything. It would be a case of sensible safety measures, given the kinds of climates we have. You know, evil is not to be underestimated. You can't underestimate evil. I'm telling you, you cannot. We've had so much history with political assassinations in this country. And that's what really makes me very nervous and very concerned about the safety of these two and the safety of anyone else who is attending the event. Now, I am confident that the event will be safe in the sense of the tremendous security presence you're seeing now, but I'm also unnerved by that. There are more military personnel in and around the United States Capitol building than there are in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And I think there's something wrong with that. More American military personnel in and around the United States Capitol building than there are in Afghanistan and Iraq combined. Now, I am all for, you just heard me say, I hope that they are going to be safe, and I expect that they will. I I am all for that. I want everything to go off without a hitch next week, and I pray, I literally pray, that the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris goes off without a hitch, really, and that everyone there is safe. But I must admit that I am also unnerved at the very same time by such a massive militarization outside the Capitol building and inside it. And I can only help but wonder what the outcome would have been last week had that presence been there. Of course, it would have made all the difference. And there just would have been a very different outcome. We wouldn't have had what we had. I mean, this was just absolutely ghastly last week. I think what I am still concerned about, though, is this militarization and this continuing lurch to ratchet up the fascism that's always been here in one way or another since the uh, genociding of the Native Americans and the enslavement of black people. We've had this kind of thing here that's grown and grown and grown. G-R-O-W-N, not G-R-O-A-N. And that has progressively, or rather, that has continued to build to such a crescendo now And I think that this really happened after 9-11 when, understandably, there had been another terrorist attack. Understandably, not that I'm not understanding that there's been an attack. I'm saying, understandably, and let me finish my thought properly here. Understandably, you would want to have a military presence when you've had planes fly into your city, into the towers of the city you live in, New York City. And I remember walking around the streets of New York City in 2001 and seeing an endless stream of military. People sworn to serve the country. And although it was unnerving, I felt different about it. People really were uh, just doing their jobs and, you know, they didn't seem to be, I don't know, it just seemed, it felt different. It was more comforting to see them, even though for me as a black man, it would otherwise be unnerving. But I have to say that this time around, even though I'm thousands of miles away from Washington, D.C., I cringe, quite frankly, nervously at the sheer volume of military personnel with their rifles surrounding the U.S. Capitol and inside it. I've seen some of the photographs. You can go on Twitter. You can go on online if you are one who has access online. And 
And you can see, you can see it. You can see it's a fascist state. It's a police state. It's a militarized zone. Is that what we should be doing? See, I get a bit torn here, dear listener. Because I really do wonder if that is what we need. How far is too far? Yes, we certainly have to protect the two most powerful people in the country as of Wednesday of next week. But look at all of that military weaponry presence. More U.S. military personnel surrounding one building in Washington, D.C. than are currently deployed in Iraq or Afghanistan combined, the both of them? I know that there was some drawing down of military in those places, but my gosh. Wow, I don't know how you square a circle like that. I really don't know how you do it. But what I do know is that we need to stop militarizing our streets in this manner. Too many black neighborhoods have this kind of thing going on in it. And when Black Lives Matter protesters did their peaceful protesting, this is the kind of presence they were met with. And not only that, they were being fired upon Tear gas, rubber bullets, all manner of things for people who are being peaceful. Now when you've got all of these people violating this sacred space where the American people's business is done, you can't even find a National Guard authorization. Nobody's giving the authorization But why should I even sound surprised? Because I really don't. Because it's the whiteness of the terrorism that is the determining level factor of whether or not you need to keep these people in line. Because when it's some white terrorist, well, whenever the cavalry gets here, it gets here. When it's a white victim... You can expect that those police and that cavalry will be there forthwith, lickety split. Literally within a minute or two, you can expect that cavalry to show up. When the victim is a black person, good luck. But when the alleged assailant is black, It's really, that cavalry is there with the quickness. Really, the quickness. We have to, in this country, stop militarizing black neighborhoods. And when I say that, I am talking about police who are coming in with this hardware that is only designed for the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. Not for East St. Louis, not for Detroit, Michigan, not for Flint, Michigan, not for Oakland, California. And just about a month ago or so, the House and Senate passed this $740 billion military bill. And I am sure that somewhere in that bill, there is some provision calling for additional military armaments and weaponries and all kinds of things to be given to police departments and probably calls for a budget for all of that to be allocated to. And I find that especially distasteful, especially when you've got people who are still without stimulus checks, you've got people who don't have jobs and they're wondering where they're going to find one. You've got so many different things. People on the margins, people who don't have a roof over their head anymore or are going to be without one over their head. And what's going to happen to the moratorium 
Once the moratorium is over, what happens to the accrued months where someone's missed their rent payment or not been able to pay it? Will that be forgiven? Will the landlord say, oh, you know, pandemic. Oh, I get it. Sorry. Somehow, I don't think that the most of the landlords in this country are going to be in a very forgiving mood. Just a hunch. To be continued. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. Now there's a brand new web page, especially for this podcast. The Politocrat Daily Podcast can now be found on thepolitocrat.com. A brand new page that centralizes all of the places that you can listen to this podcast. The major platforms and many others at thepolitocrat.com. Lots of content that you can see there right now and every single day. So subscribe now to the Politocrat Daily Podcast and make sure you visit thepolitocrat.com. Thank you.